morning. Good morning, family. We're so glad you're here. Uh, we're glad you're online if you're uh, worshiping with us that way as well. It's a little chilly in here, so you'll have to cozy up together as we worship this morning. We just invite you to stand with us as we do that if you're able. Um, King David in Psalm 63 says, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. Amen. So let's do that tip this morning. Two, three, four. <laughs>
the poor and powerless All the lost and lonely All the thieves will come confess I know that you are holy I know that you are holy And all
and release the children so we can have more seats to sit in. <laughs> Thank you, worship team. That was fantastic. Ah. 
Morning, everyone. <laughs> it's much, much warmer in here than outside, isn't it? <laughs> uh, my name is Caesar. I'm the youth director here, and it's a pleasure to be here with you all in this warm, warm space. I have a few announcements today. First, if you are new or you're visiting, welcome. We're happy to have you. We, unfortunately, do not have bathrooms in here. That's a very, very unfortunate thing. So if you need to use the restroom at any point, you have to venture out there. You have to go outside, go towards that parking lot. There's a little fish pond. You make a left, and there's a building all the way down there that says restrooms. And if for some reason it is locked, please let us know, and we'll unlock it for you. It shouldn't be locked, but just in case. Uh, the other thing, if you notice back there, we have this display. And it is there for you to go ahead and take selfies and pictures with, uh, with you and your family. And then on that table are some goodie bags for kids. So we'd like to encourage you, please, take goodie bags. <laughs> uh, the next thing, I don't know how many of you know this. Usually what happens during first service is we stream the service live. And then if you want to go back later, you can go ahead and listen to it on YouTube. But we have other options outside of that. We have Spotify. There's Apple Podcast. Uh, I think, yeah. <laughs> and so if, if you didn't know about that, please go check that out. And yeah, I, I was listening through it yesterday. Good quality. We have a good sound team back there. They <laughs> that was for you guys. <laughs> and then the, the other thing is I, I want to say thank you all to all of your giving, you know, your time, your prayer. Your, your efforts, everything has is, is been incredibly helpful and valuable, especially as we get closer and closer to the building. Um, but if you're new, there's two, three ways, I guess you can check, nope, two, day, two ways you can give. We have the black box in the back, and then we have our app uh, and our, our website. And when you do is when you go into the website, there's a little drop down and it tells you general or building funds. So you go ahead and pick from the two where you would like to give. Uh, and if you haven't downloaded the church app, please download that. A lot of times whenever we plan events, we usually like to use that so we can get a head count of who's going to be at these events so we can plan accordingly, give enough food, give enough chairs, and yeah, that's everything I have. That is all the announcements, so I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Tim. Good deal. Thank you very much, Caesar. Don't you guys enjoy Caesar's nervous laughter? <laughs> yeah, all right. Hey, uh, just one more announcement. Um, we've been talking about small groups over the last few weeks, and uh, this is something we really want to get serious about. Before COVID, we were a church of small groups, and we had an abnormal amount of small groups meeting throughout the week compared to the size of our church. A lot of people go into our small groups that didn't even attend our Sunday morning services, and I've had questions about that. Can you... Uh, attend a small group even if you don't go to Sunday morning services. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. That's, that's great. Um, but we've been wanting to get that ministry up and running. It was kind of weird. Like during COVID, uh, like people for some reason weren't wanting to meet in other people's homes a lot and just weird stuff. I don't know. And uh, it's been something we've wanted to get going. And uh, as we have been watching our church grow on Sunday mornings, our small groups provide other ways for people to hear the gospel and to become a part of the church. There's people that can't make it on Sunday mornings because of work schedules. Um, people that aren't here on Sunday morning that watch online, uh, possibly because they are just nervous about being in a group this size, and specifically they've heard about you guys. So, um, you know, they might watch online but be able to go to a, a midweek uh, small group. So we're so serious about that, and our elders, as we've been praying about that and talking about it, we are just taking a step of faith to step out, and uh, we, we've had Daniel working part-time at our church, and uh, Daniel, why don't you come up here so people know who you are, actually, but this, uh, starting Wednesday, Daniel's going to start working full-time for our church. All right. A few of you are like, I've never seen him before. Um, and that's because he shaved. So <laughs> we had a wedding here yesterday, and I walked in, and I was like, oh. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Daniel Rydell is going to be uh, on staff full-time starting Wednesday, and uh, his main duty will be working with our small groups. So I want you to be able to see him. If you 
are a small group leader or you are considering it, I want you to introduce yourself to Daniel today if you can. Uh, Daniel's a great guy. He would love to take you out to coffee <laughs> and, uh, and just to be able to talk about that. So um, I'm just excited about this. I'm excited to see what happens through this ministry. And we'll be, we'll be talking about this more and more. Um, I don't know. I, I was even thinking yesterday, I don't know if we should call them small groups. Because our goal isn't to have small groups, it's to have community in the groups. So maybe we should call them community groups. I don't think anyone's ever thought of that. Yeah, I know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's a new thing right there. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, we'll figure something out. But anyways, just wanted to introduce you to Daniel. So give him a big thank you. All right. <clears throat> well, with that, let's pray and then we'll get into today's message. Lord, I love you so much, and God, I, I am very thankful for the church that I get to be a part of. Just thank you for what you are doing and gathering people together to get to know you more, to hear your gospel, to worship together, to pray together, and, and Lord, thank you for the way you are speaking to people. Thank you for the way you are moving in our lives, and Lord, our, our desire goes beyond just wanting to know you more. It goes on to wanting to make you known to more people. And so, Lord, today as we sing that song, go on and shout it, God, I pray that you would turn us into a church of people that are just so head over heels in love with you, so excited about what you are doing, experiencing you through your word and our lives by your Holy Spirit, that, Lord, we can't help but just bear witness of who you are to the people around us. And God, I, I just, I thank you for the people that are coming to know you, and I'm excited for those who are about to come. With all this, Lord, today we say we love you, we trust you, and we pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ, and everybody said, amen. amen. One of the things that always amazes me after I preach a sermon is to get feedback from people and hear what you heard. And uh, sometimes, you know, you get, the, you get the, hey, great sermon, great job, things like that, which is, that, that's great, that's great. Um, every once in a while, you get the, what was that? Um, but it's really fascinating when people actually tell me what they heard me say. Because a lot of times, I'm like, <clears throat> I said that? I don't remember saying that. And somebody is moved by something that was in the scripture, a verse that we didn't highlight. Uh, maybe they're moved in a way by something I did say, but that's the Holy Spirit speaking to us through his word. And there's power in the word of God. If you have ears to hear and eyes to see what God is doing, uh, just... You guys have heard me talk about stuff like this before if you've been here for a while, but uh, I just, this past few weeks have been really rough ones for me. How many of you would say, yeah, I, I, I agree with that statement. The past few weeks have been rough ones. All right. I, I went on a walk this week, and my walk started out like this, where I was heavy, I was burdened, I realized my shoulders were slouching, uh, my head was down. I, it just, it wasn't enjoyable. I was doing it because I needed to do it. But halfway through the walk, I started looking up. And when I looked up, I'm realizing there's not a cloud in the sky. It's full sun out here. Um, I get to work on my tan, right? Uh, I, I realized, like, this is a beautiful day. And, and look at the fall colors. Look at these leaves just sort of falling down slowly. I start noticing, you know, squirrels and rabbits. And, and literally, as I'm watching everybody else walking up and down the logging road with a posture of just kind of being down and concentrated, um, an eagle, <laughs> right, just flew right over, like flying down the logging road. And people aren't noticing it. And it just so hit me. And I was like, Lord, when I come to church, when I approach your word, I want this to be a time where I'm looking up, a time where I'm saying, Lord, what do you want to say? What do you want to do? And I firmly believe if you come to the word of God with that attitude, leaving space for the word to speak, you will hear something from the Lord. 
We're going to be in Genesis 42, starting at verse 1 today. And as we look at this, just really quickly some background. The background of this story is that there is a man named Jacob who has 12 sons. One of his sons named Joseph um, got sideways with 10 of his brothers, and uh, they sort of did this thing by selling him as a slave, and he ended up in Egypt, in a distant land. The story of Joseph is long, and I can't go into every detail, but Joseph went from being a slave to being in prison, but God moved in his life in some incredible ways. And now when we come to this story, God has allowed Joseph, in his past he dreamed prophetic dreams, but recently he has interpreted Pharaoh, the king of Egypt's dreams in such a way where they came true, and God has lifted Joseph up to be the most powerful man in authority in Egypt with the exception of Pharaoh. He is in a place of incredible power, blessings, and authority. There is a drought going on in the land, and Joseph was wise enough to plan for it. And in Egypt, there is abundant grain and food for people to eat. That's where we pick up Genesis 42, verse 1. We read this. When Jacob learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt... He said to his sons, why do you look at one another? And he said, behold, I have heard that there is grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there, that we may live and not die. So 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with his brothers For he feared that harm might happen to him. Thus the sons of Israel came to buy among the others who came from the fam for the family uh, for the famine, hello, uh, was in the land of Canaan. Now Joseph was governor over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. Where do you come from? He said. And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed of them. And he said to them, you are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said to him, no, my Lord, your servants have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants have never been spies. Stop there for just a minute. Um, A few comments about what we just read. Uh, We're going to see this term a few times, but just to clarify, uh, when the term comes up over and over again that they came to see the nakedness of the land, he's talking about the uh, security and the might of the land to see if there were any gaps in uh, their military lines to see if there was a way they could come and somehow steal the food to basically see if they were prepared. Um, It's a little bit of an odd statement for us in our culture, uh, but that's what's happening there. A second thing, this is remarkable when you realize that Joseph totally recognizes his brothers, but they don't recognize him. Why? This is 20 years after he had been sold into slavery. Uh, Actually, more than that. It's this incredible thing when you look at it. Joseph is a lot older When they last saw Joseph, he looked like them. He was a Hebrew living in Canaan. Now Joseph is dressed like an Egyptian of power and might. That should make sense to us. Um, You know, I, I, I quite frequently get the comment when I go to a wedding or a funeral that I am performing, 
People look at me when I walk in and they say like, wow, what happened to you? You, you cleaned up. All kinds of comments because you aren't used to seeing me wearing a black suit and tie, right? So when I dress that way, it doesn't look like me. It doesn't look like me. It's sort of like the, the three times in my 50 years of living that I've seen my dad without his glasses, and I don't recognize him, right? Um, the one time I saw him without a mustache, I really didn't recognize him, right? I'm like, who is this man? Um, he, he, there's something different about Joseph at this time. He recognizes them that quick, but they don't recognize him. But Joseph also remembers the dreams that God gave him. Now, that's an interesting statement because in the previous chapter, we read about Pharaoh having two dreams and Joseph interpreted those dreams. And if you remember, Pharaoh's dreams were similar and Joseph says to him, they are one and the same. One was with cows, one was with corn, but the dreams are the same and the meaning is the same. And because God has given you two dreams, that means that this matter is settled and it will happen. Interesting that that's what he said to Pharaoh. And I wonder if it clicked with him at the time or not, that when God at the age of 17 gave Joseph two dreams, they were identical. And if when he said that to Pharaoh, he knew, I had two dreams, that means it's fixed, it will happen, or if it's not to this point in time, where all of a sudden inside with him, it clicks, like, whoa, wait a second. The words I spoke to Pharaoh about his dreams, I needed to apply to my dreams because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. At the age of 17, God gave Joseph a prophetic dream twice of what would happen. Did Joseph, when he was sold into slavery, hang on to that? Possibly. Was it when he was in Potiphar's house and Potiphar's wife lied about him and he was thrown in prison? Is it possible that he hung on to that? God didn't give me one dream. He gave me two dreams. So it will come to pass. And what we see right here, decades later, is those dreams being fulfilled. And I bet on one hand, Joseph is sitting here just going, wow, God is an amazing God. I never expected this to happen. In fact, at the end of the previous chapter, we read that he had two sons, and by the names that he gave his sons, it was clear that he put his past life aside, and he forgot about his family, and he moved on. But here, they are before him, bowing down, and at one hand, he's got to be thinking, this is amazing. God gave me the dreams that they would be bowing down before me. And on another hand, uh, they probably just pushed his buttons immensely. Why? They made this statement, we are all sons of one man. Joseph was the son of the same man. And we are, what? Honest men. Uh, no. In fact, that statement in and of itself is a complete lie, right? And it's interesting, do they know that they are lying when they are saying that? Or is it the kind of thing where they really do believe we're, we're good guys? We've been living in the land of Canaan. They're like sacrificing their children. We don't do that. They worship all these different gods, but we have El Shaddai. We have one God that we worship. They're all running around not knowing what their destinies are. But we follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That God who has given us promises. I think there probably is, just from knowing people, a, a belief in and of themselves that they're pretty good guys. But God is about to burst that bubble. Verse 12, he said to them, no... It is the nakedness of the land that you have come to see. And they said, 
we, your servants, are 12 brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest in this day with our father, and one is no more. But Joseph said to them, it is as I said to you, you are spies, but this you sh- by this you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go from this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you and let him bring your brother while you remain confined, that your words may be tested, whether there is truth in you, or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies." And he put them all together in custody for three days. On the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this and you will live, for I fear God. Uh, he probably let something slip there. He's supposed to be an Egyptian, right? Worshiping many gods. But there's something that he can't do. He can't admit the multiple gods. And notice here, It's just, I fear God. A little bit of a slip on his part. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers remain confined where you are in custody, and let the rest go and carry grain for the famine of your households, and bring your youngest brother to me. So your words will be verified, and you shall not die. And they did so. Then they said to one another, In truth, we are guilty concerning our brother and what we saw, the distress of his soul, when he begged us and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, did I not tell you not to sin against the boy? But you did not listen. So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. They did not know that Joseph understood them for there was an interpreter between them. Then he turned away from them and wept. And he returned to them and spoke to them. And he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. You look at this and some people have criticized Joseph for not being just open and honest with who he was. Some people have uh, really kind of slaughtered this story to turn it up on end. But what is happening here is justice. It's justice. Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers for no good reason, as if there ever was a good reason, right? And all these years later, he is now the one in governmental position as a judge to deal with the situation. In this situation, it's not merely brother against brother. You do have to look at it and remember the position that he is in. He has the authority to do these things. And I'll say this too, as we go through this story, both this week and next week, this is going to be a a to be continued and sort of, I, I hope it's not like happy days where we jump the shark. Um, you know, I think part two will come out good, but, um, and I just dated myself, oh boy. Um, but you, you look at it, and it's, it's one of those things where God is using Joseph as a judge to bring about repentance in the house of Israel. That's what's happening. They're having this side conversation, and they don't know that Joseph can hear them. But for the first time, he is starting to hear what's going on. He thought 10 of his brothers sold him, but now he learns, wait, one of them, Reuben. Reuben didn't want to do that? Reuben was trying to say, don't do this to me? It was the other nine that did it? And so at the end of the conversation, he grabs Simeon and throws Simeon in jail. Why? Simeon was the second oldest of all the brothers. It probably should have been Reuben to take the punishment, being the oldest. He was responsible. But he now hears, no, wait, Reuben was actually on my side. So he takes Simeon, the next born. And uh, maybe a good choice. What we know about Simeon from Genesis so far is that he, and with the third born Levi, 
they murdered an entire village full of men. This is not a good guy. Verse 25, Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and to replace every man's money in his sack and to give them provision for the journey. This was done for them. Then they loaded their donkeys with grain and departed. And as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, he saw his money in the mouth of his sack. He said to his brothers, my money has been put back. Here it is in the mouth of my sack. At this, their hearts failed them, and they turned, trembling to one another, saying, what is this that God has done to us? Isn't it incredible how we blame God for certain things that we never should blame him for? Verse 29, when they came to Jacob, their father, in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them, saying, the man, the Lord of the land, spoke roughly to us, and he took us to be spies of the land. But we said to him, we are honest men. We have never been spies. We are 12 brothers, sons of our father. One is no more, and the youngest is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. Then the man, the Lord of the land, said to us, by this I shall know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers with me and take grain for the famine of your households and go your way. Bring your youngest brother to me, then I shall know that you are not spies, but honest men, and I will deliver your brother to you, and you shall trade in the land. And they, as they emptied their sacks, behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they and their father saw their bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob, their father, said to them, you have bereaved me of my children, Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more. And now you would take Benjamin? All this has come against me. Then Reuben said to his father, Kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands, and I will bring him back to you. But he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is the only one left. If harm should happen to him on the journey that you are to make, you would bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol or to the grave. You got to just shake your head at Reuben. Reuben, what we see several times. Uh, in Genesis is that he's a man who has very little wisdom, and here he is spouting nonsense. He's spouting nonsense. Hey, Dad, I, I understand you don't want Benjamin to go, but here's the deal. If we go down there and, and Benjamin gets taken as well, I'll come back, and I will give you your two grandsons from me, and you can just kill them instead. What? Like, what kind of logic is that, right? But that's the thing with Reuben. He is the oldest. Technically, he should be taking the lead in the family with the, all the sons. But he is a man of very little wisdom. He's a man of very little wisdom. And he's giving advice that is pure nonsense. Moving on, chapter 43, verse 1. Now the famine was severe in the land, and when they had eaten the grain that they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, go again, buy us a little food. But Judah said to him, the man solemnly warned us, saying, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you will send our brother with us, we will go down and buy food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. Notice this change. Israel said, why did you treat me so badly as to tell the man that you had another brother? And they replied, the man questioned us carefully about ourselves and our kindred, saying, is your father still alive? Do you have another brother? What we told him was in answer to these questions. Could we in any way know that he would say, bring your brother down? 
And Judah said to Israel, his father, send the boy with me and we will arise and go that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I will be a pledge of his safety for my hand, uh, from my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. If we had not delayed, we would have now have returned twice. I said notice the change, and the change is this. In the story, we move from Jacob being called his given name, Jacob, to suddenly Jacob being called his given name from God, Israel. And it's important to note that because you have something happening here as Judah says to Israel, basically, I will take the punishment for my brothers. It's me. If something happens to them or there's a payment that needs to take place, I will be the one to handle it. Now, this is prophetic in multiple ways. We don't know this yet in Genesis, but let's just fast forward to the end. By the end of Genesis, it is Judah, the fourth-born son, who becomes the head of the family. It's not Joseph, it's Judah. He becomes the head of the family. And already, you see this incredible change that has taken place in Judah's life. It was Judah who had the idea to sell Joseph into slavery. Judah was not a good guy. He was not a guy taking care of the family. We later read about Judah that he separates himself from his brothers, going to live with Canaanites, and there ends up in this whole issue with his daughter-in-law, the story of Judah and Tamar. But it was at that point where basically his sin became evident to everybody around him that you see Judah repent and start stepping up to be the man of God that he was created and called to be. And that's exactly what we see from these statements here. Incredibly prophetic. By the end of this story, Judah will be the brother who is calling the shots for the whole family. At the time this was written by Moses, it was the tribe of Judah that was mighty and powerful. But we follow that tribe down through all of the years. When the land is portioned out to all of the tribes, it's the tribe of Judah that gets this massive land portion of Israel, almost the entire southern half of the land of Israel. Benjamin and Simeon are there, but they are very small compared to Judah. It's Judah that King David comes from and ends up being the royal line. And if you want to look at this really prophetically, right here, Judah is a representation of the Messiah, of Christ, who is from the clan of Judah, the tribe of Judah, and is the one who says, if there is a price that has to be paid for my brothers, Lord, I will pay it. This is just absolutely amazing. As the story goes on, we read this, then their father Israel said to them, if it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choice fruits of the land in your bags and carry and present down to the man a little balm, a little honey, gum, myrrh, pistachio nuts, and almonds. A um, couple side notes. Note that it's still Jacob scheming. He's still scheming. But one thing to note too, the, the people that bought Joseph originally the slave traders, they not only trade in slaves, but they traded in these items right here. These are the same items. 
So probably what happened is they traded their brother for these types of items. And now, unwittingly, they are taking these items back to their brother. Verse 12, take double the money with you, carry back with you the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take also your brother and arise, go again to the man. May El Shaddai, God Almighty, grant you mercy before the man, and may he send back your other brother and Benjamin. And as for me, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. So the men took this present, and they took double the money with them and Benjamin. They arose and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, bring the men into the house and slaughter an animal and make ready, for the men are to dine with me at noon. The man did as Joseph told him and brought the men to Joseph's house. And the men were afraid because they were brought to Joseph's house. And they said, it is because of the money which was replaced in our sacks the first time that we are brought in so that he may assault us and fall upon us to make us servants and to seize our donkeys. So they went up to the steward of Joseph's house and spoke with him at the door of the house and said, O oh my Lord, we came down the first time to buy food. And when we came to the lodging place, we opened our sacks, and there was each man's money in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. So we have brought it again with us, and we have brought other money down with us to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. And he replied, peace to you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has put treasure in your sacks for you. I received your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. And when the man had brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water, and they had washed their feet, and when they had given their donkeys fodder, they prepared the present for Joseph's coming at noon, for they heard that they should eat bread there. And when Joseph came home, they brought into the house to him the present they had with them and bowed down to the ground. And he inquired about their welfare and said, is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? They said, your servant, our father is well. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads and prostrated themselves. And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son. And he said, is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? God be gracious to you, my son. Then Joseph hurried out for his compassion grew warm for his brother, and he sought a place to weep. And he entered his chamber and wept there. And then he washed his face and came out, and controlling himself, he said, serve the food. They served him by himself and them by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat with the Hebrews for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. And they sat before him, the firstborn according to birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked at one another in amazement. Portions were taken from them, from Joseph's table, but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs. And they drank and were merry with him. We'll continue the story next week. It's two more chapters. But here's the thing to note with this. This was a test. All of this is the story of a ruler, a judge, who has authority 
looking at men who are dishonest, sinful, trying to set themselves up as being righteous, but the judge, the ruler, knows better. And he says two different times, this is going to be a test. This is going to be a test. You're going to be tested with this. And they were. But through the entire process, the reason this is taking place is the one who is in authority, the one who is the judge, is trying to bring these people to a place of being honest with themselves and with him and getting them to a place of repentance, a place of repentance. One of the things you can't help but notice in the story of Joseph is that bad things happen to bad people. And even with Joseph, guess what? Bad things happen to good people. It's almost as if we live in a world where really bad things happen. Really bad things happen. And sometimes those bad things happen to us because it is the Lord testing us, testing our faith, testing our honesty, looking at us and saying, you say with your mouth, you trust me. Do you really trust me? You appear to everybody else to be humble and righteous, but are you being honest with yourself? Are you? Psalm 66 is an example of this. Uh, It reads this, Psalm 66, verse 8, bless our God, O peoples, let the sound of his praise be heard. Who has kept our soul among the living and has not let our feet slip? For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid a crushing burden on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, yet you have brought us to a place of abundance. I don't know about you, but I only like the last phrase in that entire passage right there. Like, I like the place of abundance. I don't like the picture of somebody catching me in the net. I don't like the picture of somebody crushing my back with a burden. And I really don't like the picture of somebody riding over my head. All right? This is the truth of the walk with God, though. There are times in life where we are tested. Sometimes it's events that we had nothing to do with. Other times it's events that we've caused ourselves because of our own sin. But God allows them in our lives to test us And if you caught in here, to refine us like precious metal. In Old Hebrew and even in Old English, the terms test and refinement were used as synonyms. The same thing. And that's what he is trying to do in those instances. He's testing us as a refiner's fire to try to get out all of the dirt and the rocks so that we will be like precious metal for him. Something that is useful. As the story of Joseph and his brothers move on, this is a testing that all of them had to go through. The test that Joseph had to go through, being sold into slavery, Potiphar's wife lying, thrown into prison, all of those years spent Wondering, God, what are you doing? God, do you hear me? God, why aren't you answering me? Joseph is finally realizing, that is why I had to go through this. 
Because God had a plan. His brothers at this time are wondering, God, why did you do this to us? Why did you do this to us, God? God is doing it because he is refining Israel, his family, his people, to make them useful for his kingdom. Bad things happen to good people. And what's the ultimate example of that? That kind of crushing test? Do you not know on the night that Jesus had a Passover meal with the disciples, that he went to the garden afterwards? He went to the garden, and and he's just asking his disciples to stay awake, to support him, but they're falling asleep. They're letting him down. He's there alone, and he knows the test that's about to come. He, he's, he's sweating to the point it's like drops of blood coming out of him. And he literally says, Father, if it's possible, take this cup away. He's saying, I, I really don't want to do this. I know what's about to happen to me. But not thy will but your will be done, and I will submit to you. And it's because he was faithful through that test that you and I are now able to partake in his kingdom. It's that refining that takes place over and over again. It's what the early church knew. It, it, Paul talks about it throughout his, apostle, uh, his epistles. Paul the Apostle talks about it in his epistles. You look at James. The first chapter of James starts with talking about that. If you look at 1 Peter, 1 Peter in the first chapter talks about the same thing. Brothers and sisters, I know some of you are being tested today because some of you have shared your stories with me. Some of you have shared your stories with me. I know that there's other people sitting here today, and you're being tested, but you haven't told me. You haven't told anybody. You haven't told anybody. But would you please consider that the Lord is with you. He knows exactly what's going on. He hears your prayers. He hears your cries. And he is taking you through this so that you can be useful, refined like precious metal for his kingdom. With that, Lord, you know exactly what is going on with my brothers and sisters here today. Lord, today I I weep like Joseph wept. like you wept at the death of Lazarus. It's appropriate when we see brothers and sisters, friends, family, going through trials, temptations, refinement, to weep. But Lord, thank you that tears are turned to joy, that anxiety can be turned to patience, long-suffering, forbearance, that weakness, weakness is made perfect because of your strength. And Lord, my prayer today is that for every one of us here who is in a trial, that we would feel your love, your support, that there would be others around us to give that love and support and that, Lord, at the end, we would be able to see what it was you were doing. Lord, today we submit to you, to your will and your plan. And Lord, I say thank you for the things you are about to do. With all this, we pray in the precious name of Jesus Christ and everybody said. You know, it was just before Jesus went through his trial 
that he looked at Peter and he said, Peter, the devil has asked to sift you like wheat. The devil's asked to put you through the grinder, Peter. And God's going to allow it. Then Jesus says, but I prayed for you, Peter, that your strength would not fail. And when you have come through it, go and encourage your brothers. Can we think on those words today as we take communion at the end of the service? Whatever you're going through, if you've gone through it already and your strength is back, go and encourage your brothers. And if you are in the middle of it, remember that that same Lord is at the right hand of the Father interceding for you today. Let's stand and let's just close out this service in prayers, petitions, communion, and worship. Worthy of every song that we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise that we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. And Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside.
love you guys. Thank you so much for being here today. Have a great week. And before you leave, either get prayer or get to know someone you don't know. See you back.